I support teachers in using educational technology to upgrade and transform teaching and learning. I've been thinking about how much of the learning experiences we create for students actually mirror authentic uses of technology like we'd see in the real world. I've been wondering how are we doing at empowering learners to use whatever tools they have to personalise and pursue their own learning goals? And is technology assisting us to move away from being the sage on the stage to being more frequently the guide on the side? And also, what ways is technology enabling us to upgrade and redesign how we do school? Hi, my name's Glenda Baker. Learning, sharing and remixing has definitely been part of the process for me as I've prepared this presentation. Many friends, colleagues and students have contributed to it. I hope our collective efforts will also help you learn, share and remix ideas as together we think big about learning. I work in a technology rich environment. At our school, every student from grade 9 to 12 brings their own Apple laptop computer to school every day. What does technology rich mean? As Don Tapscott pointed out in Grown Up Digital, technology is now like the air we breathe. What we're discovering is teaching with technology is actually not about the equipment or ratios. It's about using whatever you have to leverage and extend the learning opportunities. It might look like this or this or more frequently in some situations like this. Yes, our high school did make the decision to go to one-to-one -to -one in 2011 and 12, and I do believe it was a disruption that has caused many of us to change as a result. But don't be put off. Catalysts for change can come in many forms. Since then, I've been looking for ways to answer the questions, what factors contribute to effective teaching and learning with technology? And what does research say about the climate and culture in schools that are using technology for learning? These questions can be disruptive, regardless of whether you are one-to-one -one or four-to-one. Friend and colleague Ruth Bender, my number one research partner, helped me dig into this question around effective one-to-one -one with a search for scholarly articles. We started with a general question and then spun off into related themes until we found ourselves immersed in a huge body of material from about 2006 until now written by scholars from around the world, all investigating aspects of the topic, teaching and learning with technology. Some are studies, some are literature reviews, others case studies. Some focus on large-scale investigations and others on wide surveys. What this activity uncovered for me is that there are lots of committed and concerned people out there interested in learning about learning and providing information to help teachers like us be innovative. So, some of the generalisations about schools using technology effectively to enhance student learning include learning experiences that might be longer or include more complex work, students are engaged in problem solving and inquiry, there is a shift to more student-centred project-based work that enables students to demonstrate their knowledge and skills in authentic situations or ways that might mirror real-world experiences. Some of the variables then that supported integration of technology by teachers was positive teaching experiences with computers, teacher comfort with technology, teacher beliefs about using technology for instruction, training and support, and teacher efficacy or confidence with using technology for themselves. One of my goals in planning this presentation was to work out how to engage with you, the viewer. To that end, I've set up a web page with a couple of ways for you to interact with myself and others on this topic. I'll invite you to take a minute to respond to two polls. I'm interested in learning about the hunches and experiences that you have regarding the benefits of teaching with technology, and also what factors you feel have had an influence on technology integration in your own school. I've talked about technology rich environments, but just because there's a lot of technology available doesn't necessarily translate into effective use. Researchers trying to pinpoint the factors influencing effective technology integration in schools remind us that education systems have been mostly unchanged since the Industrial Revolution. 
Some argue that technology can be a disruptive force to innovate teaching and learning. One point I found repeated across articles is there is a clear distinction between having tech and using it effectively. To put it simply, effective teaching requires effective technology use. Computers in schools don't change practice. The system must intentionally engage in creating a process for change and innovation. There are lots of examples of schools adding technology, but are we using it to sustain old practices or for creating new possibilities? As researcher Brian Belland points out, there's often confusion about what is meant by effective technology integration, and it's hard to hit a target if you don't know what you're aiming for. So here's how he defines it. Technology integration is the sustainable and persistent change in the social system of K-12 schools caused by the adoption of technology to help students construct knowledge. How then do we translate this into action? There's no one easy way, but it seems clear there is a part to be played by us as individual teachers, by teams or departments, and by the whole school system. An approach we've taken has been to think through upgrading an upcoming unit of work and to start by clarifying what is the key learning objective. Then, working backwards, explore ways technology can help modify or redefine parts of the learning experience. Our goal is to increase the ways students participate in constructing and applying knowledge rather than mostly being consumers of it. Peggy Ertmeyer and her colleagues said, Specifically, we must focus our change efforts on helping teachers understand how student-centred practices supported by technology affect student learning outcomes. They also pointed out that teacher beliefs have been shown to be heavily influenced by the subject and school culture in which they participate. Furthermore, in a hierarchical culture, such as what exists in schools, technology use was considered low risk as long as it was used in ways that were sanctioned by a person in authority. If you are an administrator, team leader, department head, or a teacher leader in your discipline, that means you have the power to really influence how teachers use technology for learning in your department or school. The big takeaway for me in this is grasping that beliefs and practices shift to align with the current school culture. We've reached another point where I'll invite you to interact with others watching this presentation. I've set up a Today's Meet page for us to post questions, ideas and reactions. I'm going to ask you to take a minute to share a headline that captures the big ideas of this topic that are most important to you and that you'd like to remember. Headlines is a routine from the book Making Thinking Visible and it's a way of focusing our thinking and sharing key ideas. In an increasingly complex world that demands students develop a skill set that will distinguish them from the crowd, this research has taken on added importance. How do students learn and what do teachers do to support learning in such schools? I'm not suggesting that all of these things need to happen all at once. At our school, we are in more of an evolution than a revolution but teachers and students are in the process of grappling with some of these ideas. Next, I'd like to share a couple of examples that might help illustrate some of the generalisations we've covered. It's all about STEM chem science. A fellow dentist has contacted the students to determine which of three drinks is the least acidic, and hence, which is least likely to cause tooth enamel erosion. Today, we reveal the concentrations of orange juice, wine, and Sprite to determine which would cause the least erosion in human tooth enamel. 
We will also explore the relationship between acid strength and concentration. And has asked us to find the concentrations of the active bleaching agent in their bleach, as well as Domestos original bleach and Milton sterilizing fluid. We will find the cost per gram of sodium chlorate 1 in each bleach to see which brand is the best value for your money. The active ingredient in household bleach is sodium chlorate 1. And um, it is when chlorine reacts with cold dilute sodium hydroxide, and that's how it to find the concentrations of OCL, we have to measure the volume of oxygen produced. Oh. So yeah. we're going to collect the gas over water. A little bit sweeter, a little bit more like, like real alcohol. And it smells really strongly and a little bit like fish. <laughs> so we know that they're different. And you can tell that this is probably going to end up being tertiary, tertiary butanol because it... It, uh, we got it at a little bit higher temperature than the ethanol here. But uh, We'll try the sample test with the sodium dichromate. To make to sure. And yes. I'm going to do that right now. I'm fortunate enough to work with many teachers, confident and willing to take risks and try things out. Roger Onions, veteran high school science teacher, is one such person. What you just saw was some student work from the STEM projects that he set up for his AP chemistry classes after their external exams at the end of last year. Roger set out to create a student-centred, inquiry-based learning experience. Technology was just there. Students used it as needed to conduct research, to gather and analyse data, and to document and present their findings. It was a challenging process, I would say for everyone involved, and as you can see from some of the glimpses of Rog in the background, he took on a role during the project as much more of a facilitator than as an instructor. You might agree that this example doesn't necessarily hit all of the points on the generalisation chart, yet this project was a significant upgrade. Students were not given a recipe to follow in solving their problems or conducting their experiments. It was messy. They had to design it themselves using their prior knowledge. The longer time frame and the complexity of the problems were also new for students. This came out of a connection Roger had made with the University of Leicester. Their finished work also had an audience outside of the classroom. Leslie Birkland and Kyoko Inahara are part of our language department at ASIJ. They really wanted their students to use their language skills in authentic situations related to something that they really cared about. I asked one of the students in Leslie's class, Andriana Honda, to talk about her project. I actually learned a lot about being responsible and taking charge with like my own project without depending on a teacher this time. She was mainly our facilitator. Well, at first we were very uh, indecisive about everything, but um, I'm very passionate about eco-life, so we decided on cleaning up the Yogi Park. We did some research on which parks we can clean up, and Yogi Cohen was the most convenient for all of us, and so we contacted the um, an administration there, and we set up a date, and just, just from the beginning to the end, the overall preparation. Um, it took about a month, I think. Um, the new vocabulary and the terminology we had to learn to, like, especially because it's like business-like, so it was more a, like a real-life situation instead of so proper educational terminology, what we would use in class. It was more outside of the box and in the real world kind of language, so it was, it was a challenge. First, we were going to clean Odaiba Beach, so we made phone calls. We communicated with the management at Yogi Park through email, and we interviewed people. Advertisements are posters. We went around Harajuku and posted up eco posters, and um, we interviewed some people who were very curious about our work. And we also um, organized a sale of um, eco bag. It definitely gave me a better look on how to use the language more often and in a better way. It was very different. It was one of our biggest projects for sure. We usually just um, take a test or we usually just do an oral project, but this was like hands-on learning. 
So it was really great. I really got to experience what it's like to actually be out in Japan and experience um, like the Japanese culture and Japanese language with local people. Leslie and Kyoko provided their students with learning objectives and the expectations regarding the skills and dispositions they needed to demonstrate. These were about the use of their language skills, both written and spoken. The context, however, was to be in an area of their personal passion or interest. They were given the opportunity to make a real difference in something that they cared about. The students worked in self-selected groups to construct their own paths. You probably noticed from listening to Andriana talk about her group's eco-project that technology didn't come up a great deal, and yet it enabled the group to achieve their objectives in many different ways. Do you have a model to share? Share so others can learn and remix. Try using the generalisation chart or the SAMA model as a lens to identify work that you or your colleagues are doing that might be of inspiration to others. We need to feel comfortable about testing new ideas in our own classrooms and being okay with change being an evolution. The more we get glimpses into each other's classrooms, the more comfortable we'll become as we think big about learning. The theme for this year's conference is Learn, Share, Remix. Learn. Technology has enabled us all to learn from so many more sources. It's easier than ever before to access recent research and real people trying things out. Joining the dots between what research says and what it looks like in the classroom is learning in action. Share. We amplify learning opportunities by telling each other's stories. Remix. Sharing and learning from what others are doing promotes the remixing of ideas. Differences in context create opportunities to try new things in new situations and in new ways. Learn, share and remix is the microculture we've been promoting in the high school at ASIJ to support faculty as they aspire to upgrade and transform teaching and learning. I hope that you'll remix some of the ideas shared because of this presentation and take them in many new directions. Thank you and good luck.